And, uh, you know, the Bible talks about worry and it talks about anxiety and it talks about that it, it can't add anything to your life. And the toll of worry and anxiety, um, not just on your physical body, but on your emotional life is too great a toll. Right? It talks about don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will take care of itself. And um, the Hebrew writer, I believe the Hebrew writer says, it'll come to me. I believe the, the Hebrew writer says, um, oh, it was right there. It'll come back to me. There is a rest for God's people. There is a rest that is not just a physical rest. It's not like laying down and having a good nap. Um, there is a rest for your, your spirit. There's, there's a rest for your soul. There is a rest for your whole being. And the Hebrew writer says, make every effort. This is what the NIV says. Make every effort to enter that rest. So if you're going to exude any energy at all, let it be to enter the rest of God. And what it means to be in that rest is to wholly and fully trust that God is going to do what you can't, that God is going to do what He said He was going to do in your life. But sometimes, sometimes, not in this church, but sometimes, sometimes we try to run ahead and we make things happen, or we try to run ahead and grab things that aren't ours to grab a hold of. He's given us something to do, and that's to exercise our faith and to remain in rest about how, how things work out. Sometimes He speaks and tells you to do things. There are times that we, we try to do too much. We try to take it in our own hands, and it's really an expression, not, not to say this in, in you know, a, a, a wrong way, but it's really an expression sometimes of a lack of faith. God, are, are you really going to pull through here, or do I need to get involved? You know, and, and when we step out of the sphere of rest that He's called us to, we start to experience that worry and anxiety, and, and it's, it's a weight. It's a weight on your emotional life. It's a weight on your heart. And God wants us to guard our hearts, for it's the wellspring of life. The enemy would love nothing more than to attack your heart. So many times in the Bible it says, do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. But worry, stress, anxiety will do that. And so, so point your energy today to make every effort to enter that rest, the rest of God, to put your life fully in His hands, every area, every hope and dream that you have, just, just leave it with Him. Leave it with Him. Do, you know, they used to say this in school. If you do, you know, the man-sized job, God will do the God-sized job. And now that might not be totally theologically okay or doctrinally okay, but there is a response that we have. Yeah, we do participate with God, but don't over-participate. Well, and don't under-participate either. <laughs> it's a lot less complicated than I'm making it right now. <laughs> There's a sweet spot. That's in the rest of God, where in Him we live and move and have our being, and He works in us to will and to do according to His good purpose. And all we have to do is what we see the Father doing and speak what we hear the Father saying. And it might be less than what you're doing right now. And it might be more. <laughs> if you want to scratch your head, you're allowed to. That's what happens when I don't prepare notes. <laughs> oh, it's good. Um, let's use that for the ministry spotlight today. Take that as a word, though, and, and digest that today. Make every effort to enter that rest. We've come into a rest like we've never known before. We've come into an utter and complete rest. You know, some people rest so well that they fall asleep while I'm speaking. <laughs> There's no better place to sleep than in the house of the Lord. It is presence in the anointing. That's good. If you fall asleep, we bless you. I don't have a pulpit to hide a water gun anymore. 
So uh, you can rest in peace. <laughs> Sleep, I mean. <laughs> We all will rest in peace one day. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Should we end the service here, do you think? Or... <laughs> all right. Would you uh, take your Bibles and open to Hebrews? Speaking of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Hi, Rachel. Thanks for joining me. Hebrews chapter 5. Nope, it's not chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 12. That's what happens before I put my glasses on. Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse 5. Chapter 12, verse 5 says this, And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. I love the way the Hebrew writer starts this. It's a reminder that what you read next is an encouragement. You can position your, your heart as you read this to be encouraged by the Lord. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And this is something that is, uh, is happening in this day and age. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart. There it is again. When he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Verse 7 says this. That was a flashback, I believe, to Proverbs. And it goes on in verse 7 and says, Endure hardship as discipline. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a very little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. If you notice, uh, you know, the writer starts with saying, this is a word of encouragement, and then if you go on reading, it says that, you know, discipline uh, may not be pleasant at the time. It may not be pleasant at the time. But every outcome that this passage gives for discipline is good. It speaks of life, and it talks about good, and it talks about producing fruit in your life and advancing the kingdom. Everything about discipline. Look, I love, you know, verse 7 says, endure hardship as discipline. You know, there's, there's two ways, well, there's maybe more than two, but there's two ways that I want to share right now in which you can learn. You can read in the Bible and learn from the Word of God. You can learn from God's voice. You can learn from His Spirit. Or you can learn through hardship. There's two ways to learn, and the best way to learn is to come, is to, come to this Word, is to come before the one who wrote this word, and to say, Father, instruct me and teach me. And when you can learn by the teaching and the words alone, sometimes it's better than learning the other way. Just thought I'd throw that out. Endure hardship is discipline. I'd rather learn by reading it in here. And the truth is, is that you don't have to experience everything to learn about it. I don't have to experience divorce to learn 
the pain that's involved in that. I, I can read about it in here, and I can understand how God feels about it. So not everything needs to be taught by the practical application. Not everything needs to be endured as hardship and learned that way. That's often the second choice when the first choice isn't adhered to. You know, the person that's teaching us is the most loving, most wonderful person you could ever know. Your heavenly Father is so incredible and so amazing that it is an absolute joy to be taught by Him. See, I read this passage, and the reason I want to remind you that it's an encouragement is because there's a few verses in here that may be tough for you to swallow. And I, I don't want you to get the wrong mindset about who God is because there's also a person named Solomon that wrote reams of stuff about the joy of wisdom and about how wonderful it is to be taught by God and how wonderful it is to gain understanding and, and to learn from the Lord, to position yourself in that manner. And you got David that says, you know, I meditate on your word day and night, you know, to learn and to be taught of the Lord. He is so kind and He's so wonderful. How great is the love that the Father has lavished upon us. 1 John chapter 3. John, John knew, knows the, the love of God as one that would put his head on his chest and knew Him in that manner. He's qualified to talk about the love of God and how wonderful He is. And so, you know, this word discipline, it's, um, it's taken some some heat over the past couple decades. Uh, if you even look at the family unit and look how uh, parenting has been, <laughs> has shifted, right? We've taken this word discipline and it, even look over the past hundred years how, how, um, how discipline in the, in the family unit has changed. The word discipline has, has really been under attack. Now, discipline is not punishment. We need to understand that those are two very different things. Discipline is not punishment. Discipline simply means to teach or to be taught. Jesus had disciples. They were ones that were taught. Discipline is full of life. It's life-giving. Punishment is not. Discipline uh, breathes life into the person, instructions of life and, and, and the way to live. And so... Um, discipline we need to view as an incredible blessing. It's something we need to hunger after and, and thirst after. It's something that we need to position ourselves under God's fatherhood for because it is that good. And if our definition of discipline doesn't, doesn't position us to do that, then we need to get back to the real definition of it. We need to understand what it really is, how wonderful it is to be fed by the Lord, to hear His voice to hear Him instruct us, to hear Him lead us and guide us and position us. Um, you know, whether you turn to the right or the left, you hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. The voice of the Lord, His instruction and His discipline is such a blessing for our lives to teach or to be taught. You know, Jesus is ministered by, it's marked by so many wonderful things the signs, the wonders, the miracles, all the, all the things that He did on the earth. But one of the primary things that He did was teach. And one of the focal points of the Gospels are the disciples themselves. That He, he took a group of 12 and he, he had the one, He had the three, the 12, He had the larger groups. But that He taught, that He discipled, and that aspect of God is so vitally important for us to continue to participate in. And I, I love that the Hebrew writer um, puts it in the context of a father-child relationship. And that's because that's God's intention for us. It's the father-child relationship. It's not just teacher-student because there are different parameters around that teacher-student relationship. It's a father-child relationship in which the basis of all teaching 
is on unconditional love. It's that it's not just about conveying information. It's about the transformation of the heart and of the life. Every instruction is bathed in the love of God for your betterment, for your increase, for your fruitfulness, for your health and well-being, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Everything is bathed in that you know, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. Every good, and every gift he gives is perfect. Everything he says, everything he does is perfect. That's the context in which God wanted this relationship to function. That's the context because of his love for you. He wants to relate to you on that, that father-child relationship. He comes to you in tenderness and care. He comes to you as, as, uh, as there's relation. He's not some foreign person. He comes to you as your father, the one that created you in your mother's womb, that, that knit you together. This is the intimacy of relationship that God has called us to and the intimacy of relationship in which he teaches and guides and loves and instructs that father-child relationship. Look, I, I read this verse all the time because I think it is uh, relevant for today from Romans 8 where it says, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed, for the sons and daughters, for the children of God to be revealed. What the world is waiting for is for us to know who our father is is for us to take our sonship and our daughterhood and to manifest our Father out in the earth today. That's what the world's waiting for. And the, the, the attack that has been on discipline and instruction, the, uh, and I'm going to explain it a little more in detail, but the attack that's been on it has, has joined itself to this father-child relationship in which, <laughs> you know, I'll ask you this this morning. What kind of child do you want to be? Because you can't remove yourself from being a son or daughter, but you can decide what kind of child you want to be. In the, the parable of the lost son, we see, we see two brothers, we see two sons. And at no point did the younger son that ran off and squandered the father's inheritance, at no point was he ever not a son. But there are some other labels or adjectives that you could use for the type of son that he was being at the time. You can fill in your own blank there. But you could also say the same for the other son. The other son had his own stuff going on, but at no point were they ever not children of the father. And we have the honor of being children of the father in this generation and in this season right now. But we get to d decide what kind of children are we going to be. Are we going to listen to Hebrews 12? And are we going to yield to the Father's instruction? Are we going to be taught and nurtured and loved by the Father himself in that intimate relationship? Or are we going to cast off restraint? Are we going to uh, make light of the Lord's discipline? Are we going to make light of it and treat it like, well, you know, I didn't like what he said there, so I'm just going to move on with something else. Because the world's waiting for us. The world's waiting for you. Your family, your neighborhood, your community, our city, it's waiting for us as the body to manifest a father, to manifest our loving Heavenly Father, to be authentic, genuine sons and daughters in full manifestation to manifest a Father that is so good. This word discipline, even instruction, teaching, it's, it's, come, under, uh, it's come under fire in the earth today. And, and this is important for today because so many of the world's issues correspond with this parent-child relationship or this instruction of teaching. And I want to give you, I think, three, three ways, three things that are going on in the earth today in which we see this. And one is this, 
is that there is an identity crisis in the world today. There's an identity crisis. People don't know who they are, and they don't know whose they are. And I'm confident that if people know whose they are, they will know who they are. The prodigal, the lost, the younger son didn't know his true identity. He, he, he thought he was one person, so he took the inheritance and he went and manifested who he thought he was until he found himself longing for pig food, sitting with the pigs. Then it says he came to his senses. And you know what happened? He, he came back to the father, and the father loved him. But the second thing the father did was affirm his identity with the ring, the robe, the sandals, and the fattened calf. He says, son, you were confused about your identity, and you went and behaved in a manner that was according to who you thought you were. And that's happening in the earth all over the place, all over the place. But there is a father that knows who you are. He knows your identity even if you don't know it. He knows the identity of everybody on the planet. And he affirmed that son's identity with the signet ring, uh, the, the robe of the family, right? The sandals, the fattened calf, all these are symbols of whose family he's a part of, of whose he is. That's why this is so important, to understand our father, son, or daughter relationship and to operate in it. Look, here's, here's another thing. The divorce rate is high and the family unit in many places is crumbling. And it, it makes it really hard for children in these, in these situations. The world needs to see that there is a father and a good father. So many people are experiencing parents that are in difficult places. And we've got children growing up having this picture of what parenthood is and having difficulty relating to a heavenly father because they've already got a picture of what a parent is. And there are so many aspects of God that sometimes we skew because of our human relationships. There are so many aspects of God where He is perfect, where maybe we, we haven't been or we haven't experienced that, but He is perfect. So we look at the Word and we get to know Him. We get to know what He's like. We come into meetings and experience His presence and we taste and see that, that the Lord is good. And this is what the world needs to experience. They need the sons and daughters of the King to represent the Father out there so that they can know what He is really like. And when people know what He is really like, nobody will be able to resist him. If we could all see him clearly as he really is, the church has been tasked with the responsibility to represent God as he really is. It's got to start here. We've got to see him as he really is. We've got to experience him in all his glory and all his goodness and his unconditional love, and then we've got to take that out into our communities. I believe there'd be a lot more expression of the church and the communities and, and of evangelism if the church understood this. We'd be free to run through the streets like, like the woman at the well and say, come meet a man. Ha. Huh. Ha. Huh. Come meet a man that told me everything I've ever done, that knows me better than anybody else ever has or ever will. Come meet this person. He's too glorious. And he's too wonderful to miss. The third thing that's going on in the earth today is this thing of autonomy, of that each individual gets to decide their own values. That living in community has been thrown out the window because I do what's best for me. And all of a sudden, we don't understand or, or we move outside of the realm of, hey, I still have a heavenly Father that is parenting me, that has given me instruction, that is leading me in the way of seeing. He is the way, the truth, 
and the life. There is a way to live. There is a way to go, and, and He is the way. There are so many things right now that we see on the news that the enemy, the father of lies, is speaking against the instruction of our good Heavenly Father. There are so many lies right now that line up with this, the father-child relationship, the things that God wants to express in and through us. There is an attack right now from the pit of hell against what I'm talking about this morning. The importance of this, of expressing the father-child relationship is so important. When we believe right things, we will do right things. When we believe the right things about God, we will manifest Him properly. But the father of lies is doing what he does best. He's lying. He's lying. He's lying. So we talk about positioning ourselves under the fatherhood of God and and getting back to the true definition of discipline, understanding it's to be taught. And there's life in God's teaching. There's life in receiving His instruction. And then we come to something I've talked about before, not too long ago, but we come to like John 6, where, you know, Jesus preaches this sermon about eat my flesh and drink my blood. Right, and, and, and this is what it says. It says, you know, many of the disciples, because there was more than the 12 there, it says many of the disciples said, this is a hard teaching. This is what it says in the This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And then it says that many of them left Jesus at that moment. I'm telling you right now, there will come a time in which what he says might not be what you believe at the moment. In, in where what he says might not be what you want to do at the moment. And in that moment, you've got to decide, am I going to behave like an authentic and true son or daughter of God and listen to my father's instruction? Or am I going to make light of the, of the discipline of God and do something else? and go in another direction. I know what it's like to say no to God. And then hindsight's 2020, and to look back and see how my life actually stalled in that moment. How literally it stalled in that moment. The forward momentum that I had with the Lord, the forward momentum of hearing His voice and working in ministry stalled because I did not respond to something he had said. And I thought, it's, it's not a big deal. It's, he'll say something else and then I'll do, I'll do that, right? My life actually stalled in that moment until I came back to it, until he, <laughs> no, this is what happened, until I endured the hardship. Where was that? Verse 7, was it? Endure hardship as discipline. I didn't learn with option number one. And I had to go through the hardship of number two to learn the lesson. And it's the hardship that helped my heart respond properly. It's those trials that are the testing of my faith that develop perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that we can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's a good time right now for the church to be mature and complete anything. So this word of encouragement is for you to position your heart to respond to the Lord's, the Lord's voice so that we don't have to get to verse 7 and endure the hardship as discipline. I choose option one. Just felt I should say that publicly. I choose, I choose option one. Listen to the voice. Do what it says. Do what he says. How will you respond when God says something that you don't want to do? How will you respond when he speaks the truth where there's an area you're believing a lie? Maybe there's a lie that you've believed 
where you've actually built a section of your life around this lie. And when you hear the truth, you think, boy, I, I've put a lot of work in in this area. And if this truth is true, which if God spoke it, it is, you think, what are the consequences of this area of my life if I receive this truth? Because I've journeyed this far with this lie, and I've journeyed this far and built this. And if this is the truth that I need to respond to, then this area may come crumbling down. It may have to be rebuilt. But we, we, th this is not in my notes. This is a word for somebody today. This, this area of your life that you're guarding and protecting because you've put a lot of time and energy into it, it's not worth holding it up. It's got to crumble. The truth is a better foundation than the lie that you first believed. We all mature spiritually. We all go, um, you know, from, uh, he teaches line upon line. You know, we, we all learn in this manner. We go from spiritual milk to spiritual meat. But you've got to leave behind the milk. Sometimes you have to leave behind the things that the milk built to step into the meat. I'm trying to massage this because I know it's a word for somebody today. There is a truth, and if you believe the truth, it'll make you free. And you'll be surprised at how quickly that area of your life can be rebuilt when it's based on the truth. Unless the Lord builds your house, they that labor, labor in vain. Let the Lord rebuild that area of your life. So we see in, in John 6, we see one group made a decision and left, offended. Who can accept this? They left. God will often take an opportunity to see where your heart is. He'll often drop a word to, to see where your heart is in a certain area to see how you will respond. But one group stayed because they were engaged in what Jesus offered spiritually. They were engaged. They would tasted and seen that the Lord is good because they said, you know, Jesus says to them, well, aren't you going to go too? And I think it's Peter that says, well, where are we going to go? With you are the words of life. You carry the words of life. There will be a moment where Jesus says something and you don't understand it. It was obvious they didn't understand what he was talking about at the time, but they said, but I trust the man. I trust my heavenly father. Well, I, man, I don't understand this teaching. I don't understand this passage in the Bible. And at that point, you've got to hold it like this until God brings the revelation. But you can't say, wow, you know, that, that offends me. I'm, I'm going to close that door and go in another direction. You've got to hold it like this and say, well, I don't know, but, but I know God. You know, I, I don't know exactly what he meant by this or, or why he's calling me to do this just now, but I know him and he is good. And he loves me and he's never let me down. I love that song, man. Oh. He's never let me down. And I trust him with my whole heart. And he'll test you with something you don't understand. He'll give you something and he'll see how you respond. Are you faithful to him? Are you true to him? Are you positioning yourself as a son or a daughter today? All right, just, just a couple more. I mentioned Solomon earlier. Solomon, book of Proverbs, so many, so many incredible Proverbs. And in, uh, in 4 7, it says this it says, Wisdom is supreme. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. That makes sense, doesn't it? If wisdom is supreme, therefore, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, gain understanding. And I'll tell you right now, that's not talking about money. Maybe it is if you like to buy books. <laughs> Guilty. But understanding costs you your pride. It costs you your selfishness. It costs you a whole host of other things to position yourself as a child under the mighty hand of your heavenly Father. Gain wisdom. Gain understanding. Where today are the Marys that just love to sit at Jesus' feet and hear what he's saying? You know, where, where are the Solomons? Because I believe that God 
you know, Solomon lived back then, but the spirit of wisdom is alive today. God wants a generation, a church full of Solomons, full of, full of wisdom. You know, we honor the spirit of wisdom and, and revelation here. That, look that up this afternoon. Isaiah 11, the sevenfold spirit of God, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. We honor that, that spirit, the many faceted spirit of God and the manifestations of that. You know, the world needs some wisdom. Can you imagine if the spirit of wisdom rested so strongly on the church that just as the Queen of Sheba traveled halfway around the world or traveled so far to come and see Solomon, that people would start coming into churches to get advice? Can you imagine if City Hall and, and Queen's University, and can you imagine if people said, wow, look at the wisdom that rests on the church. I need a solution. I'm going to go there. Do you think it's possible? Yeah, I know you do. You're such a great church. Well, let's paint these pictures because this is feasible. This is possible. The things written beforehand, I think Romans 15 says, the things written before were there to instruct us. If it happened then, it can happen now. To sit under the wisdom of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord, to carry the spirit of wisdom so that people start to look to the church all of community, all of the earth starts to look and say, I've got a problem. I need a solution. I know who's got an answer. God's got it. Yes, we are God's people. Work through us to, to bring wisdom in our day and age. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Just debating whether I want to do the last point. There's this picture in, in the book of Revelation, right? We all know the verse. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone answers and lets me in, I will come and dine with them, right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And, you know, I was just meditating on that verse a while ago, and I just got this picture of of Jesus at our front door. Picture Jesus at, at your front door, okay? Jesus is on the property. If, if you look out your peephole, you can see him. You know, you can peek out the front window. You know, you probably got curtains on your windows so people can't see in your house, but I know, you know, you can move those and see who just knocked at the door. And Jesus is saying, you know, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And it's like for a lot of believers, Jesus is at the front door, but we haven't let him in. Or there are areas of our life in which he's, he's, he's at the door knocking and saying, hey, can I come into this area of your life? Can I participate with you in this area of your life? Can I be your loving Heavenly Father in this area? But for many believers, you know, we're satisfied with knowing he's on the property, you know, we, we come to church and we say, well, you know, I, I know he's here. I know he's on the property. But sometimes we keep our hearts closed from the dining. Sometimes we think that's too intimate. You know, that, that area, that's, that's too vulnerable. That's, that's too much. You know, I enjoy coming to church and sensing the presence of God and knowing he's at the front door. But to, to let him into that area... I'm not, I'm not sure. But it's that area where the dining happens, where the word is spoken, the word that we live on. We don't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The dining that God has for us is to feast on his word. See, we, we want to hear the voice of the Lord, but, but some people are only hearing the knock at the door. And some people are satisfied. They see, oh, I hear, I hear a noise. And it's God knocking, but it's not His voice. And some people are satisfied enough to know, well, He's there. And that's enough to satisfy them. But He's not at the level of intimacy that He gave His life for on Calvary. And it's not the level of intimacy that He paid the ultimate price for. And it's not the level of intimacy in which we feast 
from the words that he's speaking in which we fully engage in the fullness of who God is. It's like, it's like the portion. We've got a portion. We, we hear the sound of the Lord. He's knocking at the door. Hey, you know what? If I want to see him, I'll just pull the curtain back and look out the window. Maybe I'll wave to him. But there's still a dividing door in which we haven't said, God, just take it all. Just, just come in and, and do whatever you want. The, the total yieldedness to God, our Heavenly Father. That place where, <laughs> where we experience the union. The union's happened, but it's, it's that place where we dine. Deep calls unto deep. Place of intimacy. The tangible manifestation of His presence coming in and, and dining with us. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Father, we want to be a people that experience the fullness. We want to be a people that move into the fullness of God and experience all that you have. And I just pray that if there is any area where the door is still shut, let us not be satisfied with you just being on the property. Let us not be satisfied we're just looking out of the peephole and seeing you standing at the door. Let there be a hunger and a thirst, a supernatural hunger and a thirst that overtakes us to have nothing less than the dining and the communing with the Spirit of the living God, with Jesus himself. Today, Father, I just say, I let you in. I open the door. I want the dining, position myself as an authentic son of God to receive every word, every instruction, to be taught in this season, this season in this generation for the purposes of God that are happening right now, right now, the fullness of God. Position myself that way. God, mark this house, sons and daughters of the living God that know who their Father is and that represent Him well. That represent Him well. Thank You for the drawing. Thank You for the yearning. Thank You, God, just for that incredible Spirit that pulls us into Your heart. The experiential closeness of God. We can't get any closer because we've been unified Yet the Bible tells us to draw near to God. We don't want you to be just at the door on the property. We want you to have full access. We want to sit at the table together, dine and commune. Father, let our hearts respond today. Let our hearts respond today to the word. Let us respond in a manner that positions us to again participate in everything that's going on in the world today, everything that you've positioned the church for, everything that you've positioned us individually and corporately for. We don't want to miss a thing. We don't want to miss a word. We never want to say no. Never want to say no to you. Father, I'm sorry for the times I said no. I am sorry for the times I said no. And now my heart, all it desires is to hear every word the resounding yes from my life to your ears to have the fullness of who you are and what you are, to be fully engaged, to be in the center of what it is that you're doing in the earth today. That's our heart's desire, and that's how we respond and position our hearts today, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Father. Amen. Amen and amen.